You know, uh, th this text is an interesting text. A lot of you have already shared your opinions on it. I just want to say, uh, I'll say, Howard, we're going down together on this thing, brother, because you read it. <laughs> right? My wife loves this text. <clears throat> In fact, I practiced the sermon with her Thursday, and she thought about it all the time. And so this morning, we got in the car to come to church early this morning, and we were there in the garage. I hadn't even turned the car on yet. She said, I've really thought about, thought about your sermon all, all the, the last few days, and I've said I'm going to be submissive and obedient. She lasted till the end of the driveway. <laughs> we did not even get into the street. That's a, that's a true story, right? I'm not making that up. That's absolutely right. But, you know, I'm very blessed in our relationship, Prudy and I have, because I do whatever I want. As soon as she tells me what I want, I do it. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what people have done with this text that comes out of what we call the household codes. But it really is, is a story about the church that the Apostle Paul is writing. And people sort of, sometimes on one side of the church, they say, well, Paul's obviously sexist, and he, he doesn't speak to a modern culture. Just forget what Paul said. Forget everything about Paul. On the other side, it, it's sometimes been, been turned into something kind of brutal. I remember when our oldest daughter went to visit a, a church with a friend in a, in a different denomination. Our oldest daughter, of course, grew up in the Methodist church, and she grew up with, with women Sunday school teachers, women pastors, women district superintendents, women bishops. She is a young college woman had said on the SPR committee, that's the personnel committee, one of the largest churches in the country, Methodist churches. So she goes to visit with a friend at another denomination, and it's a leadership Sunday. And they introduce the leaders of their church, and they introduce the Sunday school teachers of the church, and they're all men. And my, my daughter turned to her friend, she just didn't understand. She turned to her friend, she goes, do they introduce the women leaders next week? And the friend explained to her, no, there, there aren't any women leaders in our church. And at about 12.05, I get a phone call. Did you know that there are churches that don't allow women to lead? And I said, well, honey, yeah, I'm kind of aware of that. I've, I've heard of that. You know, so both sides, there's, there's a lot of debate about what this text means. I promise you that this is a powerful, transformative word of grace. If we can set aside our preconceptions about it for just the next 16, 17 minutes and allow the Holy Spirit to, to do the work of the Holy Spirit in this church, this sanctuary, this morning. Because God has something to say through his word that's powerful for us. First, I want you to know about the Apostle Paul and what he did not say. The Apostle Paul did not say, obey. I know that shows up in a, in a lot of wedding ceremonies and, and wedding sermons and, and, and preacher chatter. And, and always when I say that, as I'm preaching on this text, anytime I say that, I will have somebody walk up after church and show me in their Bible, see, Pastor, it says right here, obey. I have to tell you, that's not a translation of what Paul wrote. That's a paraphrase. That's somebody taking Paul's original words and, and interpreting it. There was a lot of that that went on in the history of the Bible. Because Paul never uses that word, obey. Not only does Paul never use it in this text, Paul never writes the word obey as in wives or women in the book of Ephesians. Paul never uses the word obey in the entire New Testament unless he's talking to all Christians. So if you've heard that growing up or someone has, has sort of thrown that at you, just know that's not from the word of Paul. That's not the word of God as Paul gave it to us. Paul is talking about something else. He's talking about reverence and respect. He, he never said obey. But let's talk about what he did say, right? What did Paul say? Paul said, if you go back to verse 21 that we should submit to one another, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. That may be the most revolutionary and counter-cultural statement in the entire Bible. There's only one more political statement I can think of in Scripture, and that is Jesus is Lord, right? That's the most political statement you can ever make in this world. And the second one probably is this, be subject to one another out of reference for Christ. 
I want to talk about the culture in which Paul preached. He was was preaching in, in a culture where women were commodities, where women were appliances there to produce families. This is my two granddaughters. We're on a a journey following in the footsteps of Paul. And this was the market in modern-day Turkey. It would have been Asia Minor, near where Paul lived and grew up, where women were bought and sold. Like we have car lots now, right? There was a market. There was a place there where you went to buy and sell and trade women. My two young granddaughters who've grown up in New York uh, aren't very excited about what they're learning, you can tell. The guy thought he was being very clever, bringing them up there to reenact being sold. They weren't too impressed with that. The idea that women were traded like a commodity or an appliance. That's the culture in which Paul grew up. There, were, there was a long series of family codes handed down first from Aristotle in the Greek culture, then on into the Roman culture. And listen to how it worked. This is something every Roman citizen knew. Man was superior to wife. Man was superior to child. Man was superior to slave. You notice how each one of those sentences begins, right? That was how that culture worked. And Paul is speaking into that culture. A word that is absolutely transformative and revolutionary. Now, to to, to build it out a little bit more, think about to where he's writing. This is extremely important. Sometimes people think that Paul wrote theological books. That's not what he wrote. He wrote pastoral letters. That is a word from a pastor to his people. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was, in its day, one of the most magnificent places on the face of planet Earth. It's still magnificent. That's that's a, a real picture from today. You, you go over there this afternoon, you and I get in a plane, we go there, this, that's what we're going to see. That's our last trip there, our family, when we went on the journey of Paul. It's magnificent. It was magnificent in its day. In fact, how many of you have heard of the seven wonders of the ancient world? Have you heard of that? Just raise your hand. Yeah, you've heard of that, right? All the scholars and historians agree that among the seven wonders of the ancient world, the greatest of them was the temple in Ephesus. And the temple was to to Artemis, sometimes we say Diana, the goddess of the hunt, was considered the most magnificent creation of the ancient world. Everything else, the great pyramid in, in Giza, everything else was under that. That was the thing. And it was in Ephesus. And it was there to worship a Roman goddess. Apollo's twin sister. She starts off in Delios, down by Saturini, but eventually she makes Ephesus her home. Now, this is a G-rated service, so I can't go into a lot of detail about her. Some of you who are a little more edgy can go home and do some research. But suffice it to say that she was considered very important into the production of crops and children. And so she symbolized in some very imaginative ways <laughs> about those sorts of things, right? And here is the greatest temple in the world to worship her. A young girl growing up in Ephesus passed through the right of, of being a girl to the right of being a woman by spending one year serving in this temple. In that time, it was driven into a young girl's mind that she was there to serve and produce for the men in her life. And that was the culture into which Paul writes. And now the apostle begins to say something that is amazing and transformative. He says that we are all called to serve one another. And that the way we we bring Christ to life in our families is by making ourselves subject to one another. In other words, humbling ourselves to allow Christ his place of authority and leadership in our families. 
Now that's the, that's the overall point that Paul is trying to make. Everything else comes under that. And you can imagine again, Paul is a, is a pastor. He's not writing theology books. He's a pastor. You can imagine this letter as a sermon. And Paul starts to preach. Women quoting the laws of the order of the day. Women, be subject to your husbands. You can imagine the crowd feeling good. Good stuff, Paul. We like this stuff. Especially the men, right? And then he says, and men, you should be ready to die. To give yourselves up just as Christ did for the church. And I sort of imagine the room going silent there. Right? Such a thing had never been said in Greco-Roman culture. There was no concept of a man giving up his life. Not just literally his, his, his living, breathing life, but his, his, his whole way of being and doing to honor his wife. It is one of the most canonical cultural statements you'll ever read in centuries of history. It rattled and it shook the very pillars of that great temple, I'm sure. The apostle is saying that we're all called to serve one another, to live out a servant life, one for the other. And he goes right to the heart of where he feels the problem is in Ephesus. Because in Ephesus, religion has been left to women. They work the temple. They serve in the temple. And men have given up any responsibility for living out a life of faith in front of their children. Now we know scholars, both church scholars and, and completely secular scholars who don't believe in God at all will tell you that Christianity spread throughout the world so fast because it was a family religion. In the Roman culture, in the Greek culture before it, men worshipped in one place, women worshipped in another place, children weren't included. Now Judaism changes that. And the church comes along and builds on that Jewish foundation. And, and, and from this moment on, Paul is saying to the church, women have a place, children have a place, we all are in this together. And then he says this really powerful thing to husbands and to men. It's interesting. It gets translated as head. But that's not the word that Paul ever used. For the husband is the head of the wife. Paul never wrote that. That's our English translation. The word that Paul uses, which I think is so important, is source. Paul calls men to be the source of faith. And he's not saying that women don't have faith. He's not saying children don't fa have faith. He's already claiming that. He's saying, men, you can't abdicate. You can't walk away from your responsibility. That in fact, the way you live, the way you humble yourself, the way you sacrifice for your wife, the way you place her needs above your own should be the source of her faith. You're called not to be over her, but to inspire her. Not to lead by saying, you do this and you do that, by, but, but to lead and to lift her up by praying for her and serving her. To be the source is to, is to be the inspiration. It's to be the encourager, the affirmer. The one who says in a family, we can do this. We can face this challenge. We can do this together with God's help. And the apostle is speaking to these men in a way they have never been spoken to in their lives. Calling them to step up and be men of faith. To stand alongside these women of faith. To raise children of faith in churches where people love and sacrifice for one another and place everyone else above themselves. It is one of the most powerful concepts 
at the heart of Christianity, especially at the heart of being a family in Christ. You know, we give in the church. Ross was talking about that. We give in the church not to make a budget. We give in the church because of it's, it's a part of who we are. It's because we believe that by sharing what we have together, we're stronger than we are by ourselves. We believe that by sharing what we have, we can truly do the work of Christ in the world. And Paul is lifting up the family, lifting up women, lifting up in children in a way that's never been done in this culture. In a way that will revolutionize the world and transform that part of the world in a couple of generations. And saying this is something we do together. We pour out our hearts together. We serve together. We pray together. We live out a life of faith together. Now, one of the things you have to understand about the Bible is the message, the content is important. But how the message is delivered is just as important. You remember Isaiah wanted to warn people, and he said, okay, if you guys keep sinning, you're going to lose everything. And he preached that sermon naked to get their attention, right? There's all sorts of stories like that in the Bible. How the message is delivered is just as important as the content of the message itself. The people that received Paul's letter, that got it, that stood up in front of that church to read it were a husband and wife team, Priscilla and Aquila. Now, if you know anything about how the Bible's written, and you quickly, a lot of you have studied it, you know this, the boss is always mentioned first, right? So whose name comes first? Priscilla, that's right. But standing up, imagine that, in that culture which devalued women and who they were, imagine a husband and wife team standing up in church for the very first time reading these words of Paul, led especially by Priscilla, where their husband is a helper. This is the second thing you need to know about how the message was delivered. You see, the apostle knew something about what it means to sacrifice yourself for the church, for one another, and for Christ. Because as he wrote these words, he was in a prison in Rome, chained to the wall, awaiting his execution. Paul knew that to to live out this faith in the way that God was, was calling the church to live it out, with a transformed role for women, for children, with a new spiritual calling for men, would lead into direct conflict with the Greco-Roman culture of his time. Paul knew he wasn't going to be the first Christian to end up in Roman chains. And he wasn't going to be the last. That if, that if, if we live this way, sacrificing ourselves for one another, humbling ourselves and lifting one another up, that we are constantly going to be in conflict with the culture. And I would say to you today that our culture isn't much different than the culture in which Paul spoke. That we live in a very Roman culture today. That the very things that that were cherished in that culture, raising yourself up over other people, making yourself first, being aggressive and grabbing what you want no matter what it did to the people around you, I would say those values are very much alive in our own culture. And the disclaimer that comes with this word from God today is that if you live this way, understand that you're going to come into conflict with the culture around us. Paul wrote about how to change the world by how we view and how we love and care for one another. And in one of the most stunning acts of the ancient world, wrote those words to a woman who would lead the church. By the very act of writing those words, delivering them to her and to her husband together, lived out the message in which he was writing. 
that our call is to fall down, to let go of our own selves, our own needs and wants, and to lift up the people around us, to submit ourselves to one another so that Christ might be lifted up. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.